Welcome to Casts and Impressions. So we're going to look at a few different types of evidences, all of which are common in that they are recorded uh, through a cast or impression. So um, the first thing that we'll take a look at is the definition between three different types of impressions. Patent, which means visible. These are two-dimensional. One example could be skid marks at an accident. Another example um, could be a uh, blood smear. Um, so this is a, a type of impression that is uh, two-dimensional. Um, a latent impression is one that is hidden. So um, this would be why development is necessary with some fingerprint analysis. So these would be invisible to the naked eye, unprocessed, but they can be developed using powders or fluorescent dyes, etc. to be able to see them. Plastic impressions are three-dimensional, so you see one here. Um, it could be in clay, it could be in dust, it could be that there is a uh, residue on a carpet and someone um, steps uh, into it and that becomes a, a plastic impression. For shoe impressions specifically, several things can be of value here. The shoe print size indicates foot size, um, which is correlated with height as I'll show you in a minute. The depth of the foot or shoe impression indicates the weight, or um, possibly even if the person was running versus walking, uh, if there is a difference in depth at different parts of the foot. Um, and then the type of shoe can tell, like maybe this shoe impression would show more of an industrial shoe, so profession. And um, there are actually jobs, like Nike has a person that they employ specifically to be an expert in every model of shoe that they carry so that forensic investigators that inquire of them about certain models um, can they can answer those questions about what color it comes in um, and, and different things like that. Now the wear patterns are really the most helpful and those are more of the individual types of evidence random unique characteristics that differentiate one shoe from every other shoe. So this would be the unique holes, cuts, and debris that that um, person has experienced in wearing the shoe. Um, but you can also tell more general things too. Uh, we mentioned body weight, um, weight distribution, um, and then further um, in order to process the shoe evidence you need to take photos of course with the photo rule. Um, and at least two different orientations with a label and a photo rule. Oblique lighting is using light coming in from the side to be able to increase the contrasts um, that the impression has left and that can make it more visible so that's another way of uh, being able to evaluate it. Now specifically for uh, lifting latent impressions, these are ones that remember you can't see uh, but really before they're developed or you can't see them well. So um, for shoe impressions, um, you may have a very faint dust, let's say, that has been left. And um, in order to be able to preserve that, one thing that um, investigators can do is to use electrostatic lifting, which um, is what this gentleman here is doing. And he is um, putting an electric current through this film, which causes that residue to adhere to the film. And um, so this makes more of a permanent impression uh, uh, visible. Luminol can also be used as it detects blood if it's a bloody footprint. Uh, and then dusting can work not only for fingerprints, but also um, could work for shoe impressions as well. So this is a little bit more on electrostatic dusting and lifting. Um, the electrostatic charges can lift that impression, and it can do it from paper, wood surfaces, asphalt, carpet, linoleum, and concrete. This is uh, the correlation that exists between shoe size and height. By the way, picture to the right here um, is the tallest player ever to play in the NBA, Man Manute Bowl, and he is 7'7", and then the shortest player to ever play in the NBA, Muggsy Bogues, who is 5'3". So um, their shoe size would also be correlated with their height, and as you can see, there's a direct relationship between increased shoe size and increased height. And then we'll transition here to tire treads and impressions. And um, so 
Uh, tire treads are categorized by the ridges, the parts that stick out, and the grooves that are used for traction. Um, and we can apply the same impression vocabulary with tire treads. So a patent tread pattern will be one that you can visibly see without development. For example, let's say that a car um, ran over a roadkill and it leaves a trail of blood um, you, from the tire impressions after that. Latent tread patterns, there are oils that are used to help um, keep the rubber soft and they are not always visible to the naked eye. So that could be a latent tread pattern, and maybe the most common would be the plastic tread pattern, which is the three-dimensional impression, for example, if the tire travels through mud. So here would be a plastic impression, and um, the value in that is that it can indicate the type of vehicle, link a suspect or victim to the scene, and um, maybe tell a little bit of the story of what happened there. Here's the anatomy of a tire. You probably didn't wake up knowing that you were going to uh, take a closer look at this today. But the tread area is um, the surface area on the widest part of the tire. The rib runs through the center of the tire. And then um, there are grooves that are the, um, the parts that are impressed here. And um, so the tire impression can be uh, a count of the ridges and grooves that go across the tire width. Um, and then again, unique characteristics, individual types of, uh, types of evidence here would be like pebbles embedded in the grooves or minor cuts and scrapes in particular places, kind of similar to the, sh the bottom of the shoe. So an investigator could actually create a known print of, let's say, a suspect's tire by um, inking it and then rolling that tire um, in the full revolution across a piece of paper. So this is a type of evidence that may not be enough to specifically say, okay, this is what has linked this suspect to the scene, but it can be something that serves to be helpful along with other types of evidence. A couple of vocabulary terms in, line, in light of, um, of tire evidence would be that if you're looking at the front of it, the um, center of this tire to the center of this tire is called the track width, and that of course varies based on different models of cars. Looking at the side view, the wheelbase length is from the center of the front tire to the center of the back tire, so that's the wheelbase length. Another thing that can be identified um, in vehicles is the turning diameter. And so you can see that this uh, Saturn three-door coupe, for example, has the best turning radius or turning diameter. Um, whereas in this graphic, the Dodge Ram is the worst. And that might be, you know, be expected as it correlates with the size of the car. But databases have these types of um, statistics that are accessible to investigators. Another thing that uh, tire impressions can assist with is accident reconstruction. So, um, you know, eyewitnesses may be off, um, people involved in the accident itself may have not been able to recall the events exactly as it happened. And so there are um, evidences of the way that the story unfolded. So debris patterns, tire marks can be clues into your, in terms of the speed, direction, and vehicle identification in that. A couple of terms associated with that, um, three types of tire marks. You're probably very familiar with the skid marks, and this happens after the brakes are applied. A yaw mark specifically is a sideways skid, and you can see that right here, and that's a result of the vehicle um, turning sideways. And then the tire scrub um, is able to determine the area of the impact. Okay, we're going to transition to dental impressions, another type of impression-based evidence. And we'll talk more about this in uh, another uh, episode, but um, just briefly, a perpetrator will sometimes leave behind a bite mark. Um, this is actually more common than you might think at a scene of a crime. Um, the, maybe the psychology behind it is that I, I, the perpetrator, have overcome you, the victim, and just to really drive it home, I'm going to eat your food out of your fridge. And um, sometimes this happens, bite out of the pizza that's left on the counter, and that is bite mark evidence. And that can be an individual type of evidence. So. Um, there, there are many differences in all of our teeth, from the size to the jaw position, fillings, crowns, um, any kind of dental work that's had done. And you may be able to get DNA from uh, where the saliva or cheek cells were deposited on that substrate. Uh, teeth development can also um, give us a clue as to age, perhaps of a victim post-mortem. So um, age estimation as well as identification of that individual if we can compare it to dental records. 
Um, so this shows a progression of when teeth will come in. Feel free to pause your video if you'd like to see more on that. All right, and I'll say uh, thanks for tuning in to this episode about impressions.